Hello everyone, welcome to home school. In the previous class, we were studying the parts of flower and among them we have completed two that is the calyx and corolla we have completed. So today we will see remaining two parts of the flower that is the andrachium and the gynaceum. So firstly we will start with the andrachium which is called as the male reproductive whorl. So we had studied four whorls actually and among them two were actually the essential whorls or the necessary whorls which were direct, directly involved in the reproduction. So, those two were andrachium and the gynaceum. Andrachium, it is the male reproductive whorl. It is the male reproductive whorl. And other one, gynaceum, that is the female reproductive whorl. So, that we will see after the andrachium. So, the whorl is the andrachium and the members of this whorl or the members of the andrachium it is the stamen. Andrachium consists of stamen. Okay. So, this is the member and this is the name of the whorl. So, what exactly is a stamen or how does that look like? So, stamen, it usually consists of two parts. That is, it has a filament. It has a filament or otherwise which is also called as stalk. Filament or stalk. This is the first part. And the second one is the anther. Anther is the second part. Filament and stalk is the first part. So, if you draw a structure, this is the filament and this part is called as the anther part. So, this whole together we call it as one single stamen and this is the filament and this is the anther. Okay, now what is the function of the filament and the anther? So, filament as we can see it, it is giving a support to the anther, right? So, this anther is actually the main part and this filament is giving a support or a stability or a rigidity to the anther. Moving on to the anther, anther is bilobed bilobed or it is dithecus bilobed or dithecus what does dithecus means so we will just see this particular part only we will take anther now this is one this is one particular part uh, uh, like and this is the second one so, this is one theca and this is the second theca. So, we call it as dithecus because there are two thecas. Alright. Hence, we call it as a dithecus anther. So, this is the dithecus anther. So, why it is called as bilobed? Bilobed because, so we will now just magnify this. So, we have only written this. This is one thecus, this is second theca. Hence, we call it as a dithecus anther. Now, if you just magnify only this particular anther part, we will leave the filament now. We will leave off the filament. So, if you take this, the structure of the anther looks like this. <coughs> So, this is the structure of the anther. Okay. Anyways, in detail, we will again study this structure in the coming chapters. I am just drawing a rough diagram here. So, now this particular part, okay, this part is actually the connecting part. You can, you can just draw it a bit inner here. Okay, so here what happens, this is the tissue, if you fold it, okay, so these are the two uh, thecae and these somewhat, let's imagine it this way, 
So now these are the theca and they have opened like this. So this is one theca and this is the second theca. Again, when you close it, you can see it something like this. This is one. And then to attach to this only, we have the second one on the other one side. When you close it, we can see it in this way. So here there is a joint. If you, if you just observe a door to the door and that frame you have a hinge like joint there so you can imagine something like that so this is the joint here so that joint is falling here and you have opened the lobes like this you have opened these two so now you can see it in this way so this is one theca this is a second theca so it is called as dithecus this is fine coming to the bilobed in every single theca Alright, in every single thick or every single lobe, we can call it as, there are two chambers like this. There are two chambers like this. One, two, this side also, there are two chamber. First chamber, second chamber, first chamber and second chamber. Hence, we call them as the bilobed. Fine. Here, we have a tissue, a mass of tissue, which is called as connective tissue. This is called as connective tissue. And this connective tissue is actually helping the uh, anther to properly close and to at times when it is required it has to open also fine so that that facilitation is given by the connective tissue and these mass of these mass of cells which i have drawn here these are called as the sporogenous tissues sporogenous tissue and this sporogenous tissue is, I mean the tissue which are present here or the cells which are present here are the sporogenous tissues are the sporogenous cells. Then this particular sac which is there, this sac is called as the pollen sac. This sac is called as the pollen sac and this is the place where the pollen grains are formed. Pollen grains are formed in this particular sac. Hence, we call it as the pollen sac. So, the cells which are present here or the tissue which is present here is the sporogenous tissue and the sac is called as the pollen sac and inside the pollen sac, the pollen grains are being produced and pollen grain is a male gamete. Hence, we call this whole structure as a male reproductive organ. So, since it is producing the male gamete, we call it as a male reproductive organ. Okay. So, this is about the structure of the anther. That is, the anther has filament, sorry, structure of the stamen. Together, together this is together called as a stamen and stamen has two parts that is filament anther this is anther this is filament and the anther is bilobed and it is dithecus anther okay since it since there are two lobes it is since there are two thecas it is called as dithecus and since there are two chambers in every lobe it is called as bilobed clear then <coughs> Every chamber has a pollen sac. Inside the pollen sac, the pollen grains are being produced. So, this is about the structure of the stamen. Now, this is a fertile stamen because it is able to produce the male gamete that is the pollen grain. Hence, it is a fertile stamen. Now, like fertile stamen, there are also some uh, sterile stamens which are not able to produce the pollen grains. So, like in every organism, we see that few or few, I mean, in a population, few of them will be fertile and few of them will be sterile. Even that happens in the humans also. So, some are not able to reproduce. So, that in such cases, we call them as the infertile or sterile. So, like in or in the same way, 
few uh, stamens are also sterile in nature and such sterile stamens are called as staminodes. You have to remember this word staminode. Staminode is the sterile stamen. It is the sterile stamen. Okay. So, this is about the structure. So, now if you see the position of the stamen in a flower. Right. If you see the position of the anther in a flower. So, they can be sometimes freely present or they can be united or attached to some other part of the flower. So, in a flower, if you, I will just draw a structure here. So, this is the female part. So, we are just drawing the uh, gynecium, th uh, thalamus and then here are the stamens. Okay. So, if, okay, if the petal is somewhere here and if it is not attached to the petal and if it is singly present, then we call such a stamen as a free stamen. A free stamen. If in case there are two or more stamens attached or fused like this two or more stamens which are fused like this or sometimes there are chances that the petal, okay, the petal is attached to the stamen like this. Here, here in this case, the petal is attached to the stamen. Here in this case, the more than one stamens are fused together. So, such a condition is called as a united condition or it is also called as a attached condition. United condition or the attached condition. So, the stamens can be either free or they can be united. If they are free, okay, if they are free, they are called as the polyandrous. They are called as polyandrous condition. The stamens which are freely present or which are freely uh, present on the flower are said to be in a polyandrous condition. So, moving on to the stamens which are united. So, if the stamen is united, then we get to see three scenarios there. So, let us again draw it in a form of a chart. So, first condition. First condition is when a stamen is attached to a petal. When stamen <coughs> attached, when stamen attached to petal. So, when stamen is attached to petal, such a condition is called as a epipetalous condition. It is called as epi Petalus condition. An example for this epipetalus condition is the brinjal. Example is brinjal. Then second condition when the stamens are attached to the, we will write it first, stamens attached to attached to perianth. When stamens are attached to the perianth. So, what is a perianth? Perianth is a fusion of the calyx and corolla. Okay. So, we, we know that. So, here if you write now. So, this is like this is the sepal and this is the petal. Alright, sepal and petal. So, here there are actually they are not fused. Sepal is different and petal is different. But sometimes, so we get to see like this. These are the sepals and these are the 
petals so sepals and petals both will be fused together so such a condition such a fusion of the calyx and the corolla is called as a perianth and if the stamens are attached to the perianth as we see it in the case of the lily it is called as the epiphyllous condition it is called as epi phyllous condition and an example for this is the lily example is lily all right so this is a second senior scenario moving on to the third one so the third scenario is something like here the uh, the stamens are attached to themselves stamens are attached to are attached to themselves are attached to themselves or we call it as they are united they are united so as i said they can be free or they can be united and attached so these two that is the epipetalous and epiphyllous condition so these two conditions will speak about the attachment of a stamen to some other part of the flower and this particular uh, last category that is the stamens are attached to themselves so if this is one stamen then we call it as a free stamen so if now there are two or more stamens which are present together then we call this condition as a united condition okay and such a united <coughs> in such a united condition the stamens are actually called as the adolphus condition that is called as adolphus condition so here when it is attached to petal it is called as epipetalous when it is attached to perianth it is called as epiphyllous and when they are attached to themselves that is when they are in a united condition we call that as the adolphus condition so now in the adolphus condition okay i will just wipe this off in this adolphus condition now there are chances that the uh, stamen can be present singly or it can be present uh, in a form of two or there may be three stamens or more than two stamens so we will just uh, write some different uh, forms or conditions of the adolphus condition here so first one is the mono adolphus condition mono mono adolphus so what exactly is the monoadolphus condition so here in the monoadolphus condition there is only one bunch of or only one single bunch of the stamens that is when is stamens are forming one single bunch that is called as a monoadolphus condition one bunch of stamens one bunch of stamens and an example for the monoadolphus condition is the china rose example is china rose then second one diadolphus condition diadolphus condition so here there are two bunches of the stamens two bunch of stamen two bunch of stamens an example for the diadolphus condition is the pea plant it is pea plant then third one it is see if it is single we call it as monoadolphus if it is two bunches we call it as diadolphus if it is more than 2 okay if it is more than 2 we call it as polyadolphus poly adolphus 
a polyadelphus that is more than two bunches and an example for this is that is more than more than two bunches more than two bunches and example for this is all the citrus plants all the citrus plants will stand as an example for the polyadelphus condition in the stamens okay so this is about the andrisium that is a male reproductive whorl so the whorl name is the andrisium and the member of the whorl is the stamen which is mainly made up of two parts that is the anther and the filament among these two anther is the one which carries the male gamete in the form of the pollen grains so i hope uh, this is clear about the andrisium so now we will move on to the next whorl or the last whorl or the last part of the flower that is the gynecium gynecium is the female reproductive whorl and the member of this whorl is the carpel so gynecium it is female reproductive female reproductive whorl and the members of this whorl are called as the carpels they are called as carpels so if you look into a structure of a carpel we will draw the structure here so there are three parts that is stigma style and ovary so this part this bulged part which i'm drawing here is the ovary part okay all right so this part is the ovary and okay here we have some receptacle parts all right so now we will name them so for the three parts of the carpels are the stigma style and the ovary so this part this part is called as the stigma we'll just enlarge it this is called as stigma this is called as style and this is called as the ovary stigma style and the ovary so what is the function of these parts now firstly we will see the stigma part so stigma part is mainly for the reception of the pollen grains so here we have this flattened surface and these flattened surface will actually have some sticky substance on it so pollen grains when they come through the wind or any other external agents so those po pollen grains are received or they are been attracted by the sticky substance which is present on the stigma hence we call the stigma as the receptive surface of the pollen grain this is receptive surface for pollen grains pollen grains so this stigma has got some sticky substance on it hence they are able to trap the pollen grains or receive the pollen grains so next one is the style parts so style is the one which actually connects the ovary to the stigma so function of the style is it connects it connects ovary ovary to the stigma it connects ovary to the stigma then moving on to the ovary ovary is the enlarged enlarged basal part basal part which produces which produces the 
female gametophyte which produces the female gametophyte after fertilization after <coughs> fertilization okay so ovary is a enlarged basal part which which produces the female gametophyte after the fertilization it means that the fertilization is also taking place in the ovary only so this is the structure of the ovary and parts of the ovary so, so now again these uh, carpels that this particular uh, structure which is called as carpel which consists of stigma style and ovary this carpel can be now it can be present singly or it can be present in more in number so if they if they are present singly then it is fine if they are present uh, in more in more numbers okay if they are present more than if, if there are more than one carpel then they these carpel can be fused or they can be free as we had seen it in the stamens in the stamens also we had seen the free condition which was called as a polyandrous condition and the fused condition which is which was actually called as the adolphus condition isn't it so similarly in case of the carpels also the carpels can be one or they can be more in number if they if it is if it is only one single we call it as monocarpillary it is finished if there are more carpels then these more carpels can be either freely present or they can be in a fused condition so we will just write what exactly those terminologies are being called as so if there if it is only one carpel one carpel we call it as one carpel we call it as monocarpillary we call it as mono carpillary okay now if they are more than one carpel fine if it is more than one if it is more than one then they can be in the two forms so they can be free or they can be in the fused form if it is free okay if it is free what it is called as if it is free that is more than one okay if it is more than one and then it is free we call it as a syncarpus condition we call it as syncarpus condition if it is uh, if it is fused then we call it as a apocarpus condition we call it as apo carpus condition so example for the syncarpus condition is the mustard and the apocarpus condition is the lotus and rose here it is mustard here it is lotus and rose are the examples for the fused condition of the carpels okay then now moving on to the inner part of the ovary we had seen that ovary plays a very important role in the uh, carpel or in the gynoecium ovary is a very important part that is because it is the part which actually produces the female gametophyte and where the fertilization actually takes place so moving on to some inner details of the ovary so there every ovary bears like uh, every ovary will have more than uh, sometimes only one ovule can be present or more than one ovules are present which are being attached to a flattened surface which is called as a placenta we'll write it inside the ovary or we'll directly write it as placenta so if you just to draw this ovary part here so let's imagine this is the ovary so inside the ovary the ovules are being present so the ovules we will just draw one single ovule here so here there is one stalk like structure 
one stalk like structure here and we have this ovule. So here it is. Okay. All right. So this particular part here. Here there is one small patch of cells. This small patch of cell is called as the placenta. Okay. So this small patch of cell is actually called as the placenta and so here this, this, particular, this part will turn into a female gametophyte. Alright, this part turns into female gametophyte and this is the place where the fertilization takes place. Hence, the ovary stands as an important part in the whole carpel. As a whole, we call this as the carpel, isn't it? Sigma styline ovary. So, this is the part which all the events of the fertilization takes place. So, now, here what happens? <clears throat> Sometimes, only one single ovule, like we have drawn here, there might be worry, only one single ovule. Sometimes, more than uh, one ovule is present and all those ovules, ovules are attached to the this particular mass of cells which is like a cushion, okay, which is a flattened cushion like surface which is called as the placenta. So, after the fertilization, okay, after the fertilization, all the ovules, all the ovules after the fertilization will get converted into seeds they get converted into the seeds and uh, and the ovary which is present the ovary will mature into a fruit ovary will mature this ovary will mature into fruit and this ovule which is present inside the ovary that will convert into a seed so if you see a structure if let's let's imagine we will take some uh, apple or anything. So, upper part which is the fruit part that is actually the ovary. So, after the maturation that ovary has turned into the fruit and the seeds which are present inside. So, those seeds were actually the ovules and those ovules have changed or they have been converted in or developed into the seeds. Alright. Then now. So, um, Sometimes what happens, uh, the, the arrangement of the ovules or the arrangement of the placenta inside the ovary will differ. So, as I said, there, there can be only one single ovule present or there can be many ovules present, isn't it? So, when many ovules are present inside, each and every type of the fruit will have a different arrangement in it. So, the arrangement of the ovules within the ovary, okay, the arrangement of the ovules within the ovary which is attached to the placenta. We will just, we will draw it, uh, we will draw as well as we will study it in detail. But, just try to understand this, the ovule and the placenta Likewise, let's imagine we have one more ovary like this. This is a ovary and we have more than one ovule now. So, this is one placenta, this is second placenta, this is third placenta, this is fourth placenta. Let's imagine there are four ovules. So, now from here one ovule develops, from here one ovule develops, from here one ovule develops and from here one more ovule develops. So, this has one specific arrangement here. So, likewise every type of a fruit, okay, I am not speaking about every fruit, every single fruit, we are speaking about type of the fruit. Every type of a fruit will have different arrangement of the ovules 
uh, attached to the placenta inside the ovary. So, such a arrangement of the ovules with plas attached to the placenta in the ovary is called as placentation. It is called as the placentation. So, now we will see what are the types of the placentation with its diagrams. We will first write the definition. So, arrangement of arrangement of ovules ovules attached to placenta attached to placenta placenta in ovary in ovary is called as the placentation. So, there are different types of the placentation that is different arrangement of the ovules attached to the placenta in the ovary. So, we will see one by one. So, first type of the uh, placentation is the marginal placentation. First one is marginal placentation. So, what exactly is the marginal placentation? So, here uh, uh, the ovules which are present, okay. So, we, we already, if you remember the structure, the or we will draw it a small diagram here. Ovary and we have a ovule which is attached to the mass of cells that is the placenta, okay. So, ovule should definitely be attached to the placenta. Without attachment to the placenta, we don't find the ovules. So, now in the marginal type of the placentation, what happens is if you have observed the P, okay, if you have observed the green piece, so the green piece is something like this and when you open it, okay, when you open the green piece, we see the green piece or uh, we see the green piece lying on one single side. We don't see it one, one P on this side, one P on this side, one P on this side, something like that. We don't see something, we, we don't see that arrangement. All the P's are properly arranged in one single line there, one single ridge there. So, that is because in case of marginal placentation, the placenta placenta will form a ridge. It will form a ridge. So, as I said, the ridge is one single, one single, uh, like there are two lobes in the green pea. So, when you, one single lobe has a attachment of the placenta. So, after you, after you take over, after you take open the uh, P there when you when you take the P out small uh, some cell, some mass of cells is attached to one single side of that lobe there so that small attachment is actually the placenta and to that attached placenta the ovule is formed in the ovule is developed in the form of the seed which is actually the edible one so the one which we eat the green peas which we eat in the uh, in the form of curry or anything else. So, that pea is actually the seed which is developed by the ovule and that ovule, if uh, when you open it, that small mass of cell to which that green pea is actually attached, so that is called as the placenta. So, here in case of the marginal placentation, the placenta will form a ridge along the ventral structure. So, when you open it, so, P, if, if when you open it like this, we will just draw one diagram. So, this is the one. Okay. Now, if you have observed the P plant, sorry, or the P fruit, what we call it as. So, here, only on one single side, okay, only on one single side, the P's are attached like this. The peas are attached like this on one single side. So, they are not present on both the sides. So, this is the ventral side of the pea. So, the placenta which forms a ridge 
along the ventral side or, or, or along the ventral structure of that particular ovary and we will just draw this first. Okay, so now these are the green peas and they have, uh, I mean, this is the attachment place. This is the placenta and this is all the ovule and this ovule is the or this ovule or this the ovary inside which we have the ovule. Okay, so now, so if you have observed this, we will draw, we will write it first. placenta which is forming the ridge along the ventral side which is forming the ridge along the ventral side along the ventral side and all the ovules are being formed okay all the green paste which we call them as the ovules all the ovules are there are being formed on one single side and ovules are formed on one side. They are formed on one side. So example here is the peas. Okay. This is the example. Second one. Second type is the exile presentation. Second presentation is exile type of placentation so here what happens so the placenta is mainly in the axial form the anyways i'll draw the diagram you will get to you'll get to understand so we i'll just wipe this diagram off so here the placenta is uh, axial in nature and the ovules are attached to it in a multilocular way okay the placenta placenta is axial and the ovules which are present in or which are attached to it ovules are present in a multilocular so locule here means that so every single locule is speaking about one one chamber so that you will see when we draw the diagram so the, they are attached in a multilocular locular chambers. Multilocular chambers. And uh, uh, see, usually what happens when you, I will first draw the diagram. Let's see, this is one ovary, and we are speaking about the multilocular here. So, we are supposed to make the chambers like this. So, I am drawing, I am making three chambers here. Okay. Chamber 1, chamber 2 and chamber 3. So, now from here the ovules will originate like this. This is the. Okay. So, two in each chamber I have drawn. Okay. So, this particular arrangement. So, here one locule number one, locule number two and locule number three. Hence, we call it as a multilocular arrangement. And, sorry, we'll draw it here. Okay. So, multilocular arrangement wherein the placenta is axial in nature and the ovules are present in the locules or chambers like this. So, in one chamber, in every chamber, I have drawn two ovules. So, this is called as the axial type of the placentation. Third one is parietal. Parietal type of the placentation. Here, the placenta is present on the peripheral parts of the ovary. Again, I am wiping it off. Placenta is present, is present on peripheral 
present on peripheral parts of peripheral parts of ovary okay so the placenta is present on the peripheral parts of the ovary uh, so if you have observed the mustard all right if you have observed the mustard usually the ovula usually the ovary in the mustard is unilocular but sometimes it it the changes or it turns into a bilocular or multilocular kind of ovary and that is mainly due to the formation of a false septum here so i'll anyways draw the diagram you will understand what exactly it is so placenta is present on the peripheral parts of the ovary an example for this is mustard mustard so usually ovary is a unilocular kind of ovary but sometimes it becomes bilocular we'll write it usually it is unilocular but sometimes sometimes it becomes bilocular sometimes it becomes bilocular locular that is mainly due to the false septum it is mainly due to the false septum so let's draw it now so again we have drawn a ovary so now we said that it is only unilocular i'll draw first unilocular and then we will see the formation of the septum okay so here this is forming two ovules and this is forming two ovules and this is forming two ovules okay but though we have drawn two on one bunch two in one bunch and two in one bunch we don't have any uh septas or any partitions here it is like this is all together it is one single chamber so we call it as a unilocular ovary sometimes what happens there might be the formation of septa like this so this is a false septum and this septum will now uh, change this into a bilocular okay so such condition can be seen in the mustard so that is called as a parietal placentation the fourth one is the free central placentation fourth one is it is free central placentation i'll wipe it off free central kind of placentation so here what happens is the ovules are usually born on the central axis and septa is are completely absent as we see it in the case of the prime rows so here the ovules usually are born on the central axis ovules are born on central axis and here the septa are completely absent septa are absent septa are absent here so it is as good as we just have a ovary like this and <coughs> so here inside the ovary we just have to draw the ovules like this okay so these are the ovules and this is the ovary so there is no septa at all and all the ovules are born on the central axis so this is the free central type of placentation the last type of placentation is the basal placentation basal placentation is we'll write it first basal type of placentation so here placenta usually develops 
at the base of the ovary where, where exactly the thalamus is being attached. So to that place the uh, placenta originates from that attachment of the thalamus and only one single ovule is attached to that particular placenta. Okay, we will write it first. Placenta develops, placenta develops at the base of the ovary, at the base of the, develops at the base of the ovary and septa, sorry, there are no septa at all here and there is only one single ovule attached and single ovule is present single ovule is present so now if you have remembered the structure i'll just wipe this all off okay now if you remember the thalamus and ovary and everything so this is the stigma this is all the stigma part, style part and ovary and here this part is called as the thalamus part. Okay, this is a thalamus, this is ovary, style and stigma. So now actually from here the ovary should uh, originate. Now attached to this only here the placenta originates like this. So this is the placenta. This is ovary, this is placenta. Placenta is all through the ovary like this and inside this uh, ovule is being formed. This is the ovule. Single ovule, placenta and then the ovary. So this is a longitudinal section. Okay, this is a longitudinal section. So if you take one cross, if you just, you just cut open this, okay. If you cut open this and if you look into the structure, then it looks like how it is being given in your NCRT book. That is in the NCRT we have something, uh, something a diagram like this. So there also it is a single ovule, single ovule is only given. So the structure which I am drawing here, this is the one which is actually present in your NCRT. Alright, so now as I said there is only one single ovule present and one single or a complete placenta and one single ovule present in the ovary. Okay, that is called as a basal type of the placentation. So, these are the types of the placentation and what is placentation is? It is the arrangement of the ovules which are attached to the placenta in the ovary is called as the placentation. Alright, so this completes the parts of the flower that is we have completed calyx and corolla in the previous class and today we have completed the andricium and the gynecium that is the essential or the necessary worlds we have completed today and the non-essential or the accessory worlds were completed in the previous class. In the next class we will uh, come up with the fruit, seed and all other remaining parts of the chapter. Okay. So till then keep watching the videos. I will meet you guys in the next class.